So it gives me great pleasure to launch this session on Ruskin Applied, and we begin with Emma Stegno, who is a lecturer in Victorian literature and culture at Ca' Foscari University in Venice, Italy. She has written numerous essays on John Ruskin, with a major focus on rhetoric and style, and in the context of translation and travel studies. Her most recent publication is a critical edition looking at Tintoretto with John Ruskin, which has been published in French and Italian as well as English. And it was done on the occasion of both Ruskin's and Tintoretto's bicentenaries. She's also organized a number of Ruskin-related conferences, which I have had the joy of attending in Venice. Most recently, in October, she co-organized the international conference, A Great Community, Ruskin's Europe as one of the events for Ruskin's Bicentenary. Emma is a member of the Scuola Grande di San Rocco in Venice and a companion of the Guild of St. George. And she's going to be speaking to us about Ruskin and the language of culture, framing his notions of Gothic and Renaissance. Emma. Thank you very much, Rachel. And uh, I would like to thank heartily the Huntington Library for organizing such a wonderful conference to celebrate Ruskin's bicentenary and for offering such a generous hospitality in this extraordinary place I've been discovering in these days. I'm also particularly grateful to Professor Jim Spates and the organization committee uh, of the conference for their invitation and for su suggesting that I should give a talk on Ruskin and his preference for Gothic. Uh, this has been an opportunity to focus on a topic um, that has always imposed itself on me in several ways. And the most evident one is because I live and work in Venice and his words on the Gothic buildings have always had a particular resonance. This, of course, is a very huge topic and shall just treat uh, some aspects of it, and in particular, the beginning of his interest in Gothic, the way uh, in his idea on Gothic style were shaped, and some of the main assumptions in the seven lamps of architecture and the stones of Venice. And finally, um, the Gothic, um, workmen and uh, um, in relation to the um, idea, Ruskin's ideas on work, which uh, so have been already an, a topic that has already been treated, but I shall try to just focus on, on the Gothic um, style uh, attached to, this, to this, uh, mm, this point. So, the beginning of his interest um, in Gothic. In Praeterita, um, sorry. Um, Ruskin's autobiography, written in the 1880s, Ruskin gives a specific date for the start of his interest in Gothic. Here in Lucca, he says, I found myself suddenly in the presence of 12th century buildings originally set in such balance of masonry that they could all stand without mortar and in material so incorruptible. Absolutely, for the first time, I now saw what medieval builders were and what they meant. I took the simplest of all facades for analysis, that of Santa Maria Foris Portam, and therefore literally began the study of architecture. After those summer days of 1845, I advanced only in knowledge of individual character, provincial feeling, and details of constructions or execution. Of what was primarily right and ultimately best, there was never more doubt to me, and my art teaching necessarily in its many local or personal interest partial, has been from that time throughout consistent and progressing every year to more evident completion. The rhetoric of Preterita focuses on dramatic moments, on some dramatic moments of revelation, which are highly selective. 
For example, Ruskin dismisses the central importance that the city of Venice had in his life and privileges other cities, Lucca, Rouen, for example. This has been found surprising and significant, though, in various, various ways. Here, Ruskin points at the church of Santa Maria Foris Portam in Lucca as the place where he, saw, he first saw a Gothic building. We do not have a visual evidence of this, as far as I know. But what he says um, of this interest is uh, sound. For the Gothic, uh, the Gothic was a devotion that was consistent throughout his life. Um, the, um, we have also the evidence that uh, it really started in 1845, in fact, because by, I mean, consulting the diaries of uh, the previous journeys to the continent, or the way it was called, the journey through Europe, France, Switzerland, and Italy, uh, of 1840 and 1841, um, we, we find an unfocused interest in Gothic archi architecture. Ruskin mainly privileged commanding views from bridges and higher vantage points, views that were characteristics of, uh, characteristic of picturesque painting in the taste of Samuel Prout. As, for example, the one from Avignone on October 14, uh, 19, 1840, where his description from the esplanade of the cathedral embraces a comprehensive piece of landscape. I wish I may remember, this is what he said, um, the piece of landscape I have just seen from the esplanade of the cathedral. It is raised on a rock above the quay, completely commanding the valley of the Rhone and the port, the huge mass of the cathedral interrupting the panorama to the south, just in, in, enough to make it a picture." End of quote. The Gothic cathedral is therefore not qualified now. It's seen as a mass and an interruption of the view. Throughout the whole journey uh, of 1840, uh, Ruskin's reference to Gothic ar architecture as such is extremely rare. We have three occurrences as a whole. It is actually during the journey of 1845 that his attention dramatically changes. Van Akinbert, an eminent scholar, uh, particularly fond of uh, 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 Jim Spade, um, called this journey a transformative journey of the soul. And this journey to Italy was a transformative journey indeed. It was the fourth to the continent that he first made without his parents. And how important this experience could have been for young, but not so young, 26 year old Ruskin, we can well see now after Dinah Birch's introduction to Ruskin's overprotective family. During this carefully prepared journey, accompanied by two servants and his drawing master, Harding, J.D. Harding, Ruskin moved away from a picturesque style and way of seeing and developed a more personal pict um, pictorial language, which he called a scientific method based on a real, I'm quoting from him, physical contact with the building. This is most important in that, in a way, distinguishes Ruskin from other writers on the Gothic. For Ruskin, buildings had become like individuals whose cracks and stains and age he wanted to know, first by drawing them and daguerreotyping and then writing. His notebooks of the journey which are kept at the Ruskin Library at Lancaster, we have the director here, uh, have been rec recently published and studied carefully. And these notebooks, uh, um, called, I mean, the resume, display this eagerness and energy of discovery. 
this new perception fit within a feeling of the everyday and of the city as a whole that Ta Ruskin was developing, was perceiving, was trying to articulate also. Another dramatic moment of this journey was his encounter with Ilaria del Carretto's tomb in Lucca. Uh, this is a drawing that Raskin um, made uh, of, this, um, of this tomb. And this uh, eye, this, this attention he paid is uh, already part of this new way of drawing and on looking at artworks. Moving from Lucca to Pisa, he was caught by 14th century Palazzo Agostini. And we, ha we have two drawings of this building in, in the, his new scientific method. These drawings are important in that are among the few instances um, of, of his drawing and his paying careful attention to domestic medieval architecture. Incidentally, uh, it should be said that he had written some essays on the private houses of Europe in 1838, so very early in his, in his career. And these essays were later corrected, co um, collected under the title of the Poetry of Architecture, or, this is the subtitle, The Architecture of the Nations of Europe considered in its association with natural scenery and natural character. This work is, is early attempt to frame buildings within landscape and within a European perspective. And this will stay in Ruskin, this interest in the European broad view uh, and uh, in locating uh, buildings uh, and, uh, and artworks within the map of Europe. This is something that will be more and more relevant to Ruskin. Palazzo Agostini in the Lungarni Pisani is a wonderful building and a rich representative of the new type of edifice that emerged in Italy in the 13th century to house the growing mercantile class. In this specific interest in domestic Gothic, Ruskin seems to deviate from standard reference works in the 1830s and 1850s, because there was a massive of, um, amount of work on uh, writings on Gothic architecture, of course, and style. Ruskin was not the first, of course. Thomas Rickman's attempt, this is the title, to discriminate the styles of English architecture published in 1817 established the basic chronological classification and terminology for the different styles of English medieval ecclesiastical architecture. And philosopher and geologist William Hewell's um, 1830 essay, um, whose title is On Architectural Notes, uh, on German churches with the remarks on the origin of Gothic architecture was mainly concerned to establish the origin of Gothic style, as the title says, regarding the pointed arch. And in 1835, Robert Willis's remarks on the architecture of the Middle Ages, especially of Italy, drew attention to Italian Gothic architecture with the aim of rehabilitating it. This is what, what Willie says. It, has, it had always been treated with contempt, uh, as if it were a debased Gothic, a bad and unsuccess unsuccessful imitation of our barbarous style. But now that the beauties of architecture are appreciated, it becomes necessary to examine well every country into which it penetrated. Willis is, is a membrological study of Gothic buildings. That is, a study that treats the architectural elements separately. That is, windows, roofs, spires, pinnacles, and so on. Ruskin read 
Willis's book, and in The Seven Lamps, he said that uh, Willis had taught him all his grammar of Central Gothic. Willis was, in fact, a model for the Stones of Venice, which is, in a way, a membrological study of Venetian architecture. Like Rickman, Willis dealt with ex ecclesiastical architecture and largely neglected domestic buildings. Now, Ruskin's attention to Palazzo Agostini reveals an interest in a non-ecclesiastical architecture, an interest that he would extensively develop in the Seven Lamps of Architecture and in the Stones of Venice. The 1845 journey ended in Venice, where he had planned to stay very short, but to, to leave soon, he, said, he was saying to his parents, and where, instead, he was caught by the suffering beauty of the city. He discovered Venetian 16th century painter Jacopo Tintoretto in the Scuola Grande di San Rocco in a precise date of September of that year and embraced what would become his mission to rescue Italian art and mainly the city of Venice from destruction, a destruction caused by time decay, by war, by Napoleonic and Austrian sieges, and finally by offensive restoration. So let's move to the, to the other point and how did his ideas on Gothic took shape and what are the main assumptions uh, uh, that he makes. In Venice, Ruskin painstakingly measures and counts his stones and carefully draws architectural details, sculptures, moldings, capitals of several buildings in Venice. This is uh, a picture that he draw uh, of uh, um, a watercolor of the a main entrance of Kafoskari, the, now the, the palace of the university. This is one of the very, very few drawings uh, that we have by Ruskin of interiors. Ruskin usually drew exterior, uh, but this is one of the few, and you can see the devastation of the palace, which now is, is beautifully restored. Um, this is another... Uh, a daguerreotype he bought of uh, Kafoskari, and uh, again, he was interested in studying, in really studying the walls, the, the details. Uh, and so he also bought daguerreotypes. These are the first ones that he bought. Mm, uh, and this is a drawing that might be maybe well known to some of you of uh, Cadoro, Palazzo Cadoro. Uh, um, a drawing he made, uh, uh, a watercolor he made in that journey and uh, um, showing uh, the um, devastation also. He was uh, in writing in a letter to his father how he was quickly, he had to quickly draw the, uh, the palace before destruction would, uh, be, be, before it would be destroyed by restorers, say. Um, so, um, sorry. Um, his studies of 1845 so w would be completed in the following years and in the following journeys to, to Venice of 1846 and uh, 19. 1850-51, and were elaborated in the Seven Lamps of Architecture, published in 49, and in the Stones of Venice, published in 52-53. In the Venetian no stones, he looked for the history of buildings, and for, and also, and this is important, for an alternative history uh, of contemporary, uh, to contemporary um, writings on uh, Gothic. Uh, he, he tried to, to, to find an alternative way, and I found that what uh, Dinah Birch this morning said um, about Ruskin being always different, always trying to find a, 
a, a new path to, uh, to, to learn, to, to, to understand things. I, I find that also this ca could perhaps fit within this uh, idea, this interpretation. In 1852, while writing uh, the second volume of uh, St Stones of Venice, he wrote to his father um, that he had been experiencing great difficulty in defining Gothic, a difficulty he then felt he had solved. And he says in the letter, I shall show that distinctive character of Gothic is the, in the workman heart and mind, and this is an assumption that we find already in the Seven Lamp, a, a, a combination of heart and mind in, in the artist, but its outward distinctive test is the trefoiled arch, not the mere point. So the distinctive point of architecture, Gothic architecture, is not the pinnacles, as I mean, the, is the, the former writers had pointed at, but had maintained, but the trefoiled arch. And he, he, he says um, about the importance of the trefoiled arch that it, this, it was threefold. Uh, by mysterious ordainment being a type of the trinity in unity. Secondly, being a type of all the beauty of vegetation upon the earth, the, the three uh, elements. Lastly, because it is perfect expression of the strongest possible way of building an arch. So a technical, a symbolical, and a naturalistic, we can say. In the Stones of Venice, Ruskin identifies the root of Venetian Gothic in the apse tracery here, um, of Santa Maria Gloriosa dei Frari, uh, the, the church, um, Franciscan church, and the Gothic, very early Gothic. Uh, and in the great ducal, uh, it was built in um, 1250 and uh, began and, and finished in 1338. And uh, this route was passed, in a way, uh, to the great ducal palace, and, uh, which was the first adaptation, things Ruskin says, to civil uses. And he attached a great importance to this. He says in the letter, the ascertaining of the formation of the ducal palace traceries from those of the Frari and its priority to all other buildings which resemble it in Venice rewarded me for a great deal of uninteresting labor in the examination of moldings and other minor features of the Gothic palaces. As we have seen, Willis, Rickman, and Hewell saw in the pointed arch, and therefore in verticality, the primary element of Northern Gothic. And this is quite a consensual reading of Gothic at the time, also in German and French literature. Ruskin instead maintained a different horizontal origin of Gothic, which was debated in Hewell's uh, review of the Stones of Venice. Hewell was didn't agree, was not happy with this. But what Ruskin is looking for is the originary element of domestic architecture. And he finds it in an ecclesiastical building, in the most sacred, say, part of the church, the apse. In carefully observing his stones, Ruskin was finding the evidence of a spiritual source in the domestic building. Thus, what had to appear significant to him was that the sacred element of the Trinity, trefoil, from the apse of the church of the Frari, informed, passed on to the civil ducal palace, then to private houses. And one of these is the Cafoscari uh, Palace, which was built soon after the ducal palace. This originary spiritual element is the common thread connecting the sacred life of Venice to its political headquarters and the life of private citizens. This connection, on a symbolical level, Ruskin saw as the greatness of the Gothic style, the fact that the spiritual 
uh, all, all level of life were spiritual, because uh, informed by the spiritual um, primary element. And this connection uh, was lost in the Renaissance and therefore in modern times. Ruskin attack on the Renaissance, I won't, uh, I have no time and it's not possible to deal with this, but to put it shortly is that Ruskin saw in the Renaissance the beginning of the modern times. And for this reason, I mean, Renaissance was bad because it was centered on in the individualism of, um, and uh, which was, um, which was bad. It was against a, a spiritual and communi communi communal sense. So third point, the Gothic workmen and work. In these uh, years, uh, 1845, 1855, Ruskin was very interested in discovering the, um, the art, in studying the artist's imagination. And we know that uh, I mean, from uh, the, the previous uh, presentations, also uh, Professor Sp uh, Jim Spate, how I mean, how, uh, that, that most of his interest started from uh, Turner, stemmed from Turner. And uh, his five volumes of modern painters are centered on the, this painter's work, on, on his landscapes, and on his working processes. It was interesting to understand by looking at the pictures of Turner, what, how the mind of Turner worked. What was the the process uh, that uh, st started all of this in a way. Ruskin devoted three substantial chapters of Modern Painters II to the artist's mind. And in the one that Ruskin called Imagination Penetrative, uh, Jacopo Tintoretto, oh yes, sorry, this is the picture of the Ducal Palace showing the connection, the two elements of of the churches, uh, of the, um, the windows that he is pointing at. Um, yeah, so, so uh, Jacopo Tintoretto figures prominently in, uh, in the second volume of Modern Painters. Uh, uh, Jacopo Tintoretto is the embodiment of the creative power who paints by divine inspiration. He is a power of nature, um, unhuman, superhuman. In these same years, he developed also a theory on the mind of the medieval artisan artist. And this theory, I think, has some characteristics in common with the great Venetian painters. Uh, the, although it, it may seem uh, quite, quite not immediate uh, to of understanding, but uh, the, the, some traits are the same. And I find that it is quite, quite revealing that um, Vasari um, defined Tintoretto uh, a, a sort of barbarous, bar, um, rough and uncouth, uh, and not just Vasari. And he defined the same, he had the same definition for Gothic style. So, um, Tintoretto is defined as rough, savage, free, powerful. Uh, this, is another, this is another picture that I, uh, I like because it's a, um, a say copy of, uh, but as a study would be better to, to say, uh, of, by Ruskin in 1852 of the presentation of the Magi of uh, uh, Tintoretto. And I think that here he was, he, he, he draws three copies, three studies of this. And I think he is interested in the, the relationship with the, the supernatural, mm? the, the, the revelation that, uh, that uh, mm, the presentation of the Magi um, mm, presents. Um, So Ruskin saw in the buildings the characteristics of the mind of the artists that had made it. And this is stated clearly in the seven lamps of architecture. He says, 
Pointed arches do not constitute Gothic, nor vaulted roofs, nor flying buttresses, nor grotesque sculptures, but all of some of these things, and many other things with them, when they come together so as to have life. Its elements are certain mental tendencies of the builders, legibly expressed in it, as fanciful, love of variety, love of richness, and such others. Its external forms are pointed arches, vaulted roofs, etc. And unless both the elements and the forms are there, we have no right to call the style Gothic. It is not enough that it is a form. It has not also the power and life. So Ruskin argued that medieval craftsmen enjoyed considerable imaginative freedom to express their artistic vision unencumbered by rules of design or aesthetic judgments. The creation of the medieval artist was rude and rough, but was sincere and deeply felt. And these were traits utterly lacking in the modern world as Ruskin saw it. So Ruskin depicted the worker as heroic and as a link to a simpler and more vital era. There is something there is something very delightful in this bold expression of the mind of the great master. I do not say that it is the perfect work of patience, but I think that in patience is a glorious character in an advanced school. And I love the Romanesque and early Gothic especially because they afford so much room for it. Accidental carelessness or measurement or of uh, regularity and, uh, sorry, of execution being mingled undistinguishably with the purposed departures from symmetrical regularity and the luxuriousness of perpetually variable fancy, which are eminently characteristic of both styles. How great, how frequent they are, and how brightly the severity of architectural law is relieved by their grace and suddenness has not, I think, been enough observed. It is quite, uh, quite striking um, the correspondence, in a way, of the description of the Gothic uh, mind and of Tintoretto. This is something that, um, that struck me. So we stay, uh, stay this also in the chap- we stayed um, this also in the chapter of the Stones of Venice entitled the, "On the Nature of Gothic," a chapter that would become an art and craft manifesto, we have uh, already heard about it, published independently with a preface of William Morris in 1891. That chapter makes an important statement about work, which William Morris emphasizes in the preface. The lesson which Ruskin here teaches us is that art is the expression of man's pleasure in labor that it is possible for man to rejoice in his work, for strange as it may seem to us today, you can imagine, there have been times when they, he did rejo- rejoice in it. And lastly, that unless man's work um, once again, uh, sorry, uh, once again becomes a pleasure to him, the token of which change will be that beauty is once again a natural and necessary accompaniment of productive labor. But all, all but the worthless must, must toil in pain and therefore live in pain, so that the result of the thousands of years of man's effort on the earth must be general unhappiness and universal degradation, unhappiness and degradation, the conscious burden of which will grow in proportion to the growth of man's intelligence, knowledge, and power over material nature. This is the translation by Morris of, uh, of Ruskin's Nature of Gothic, which made m- maybe a more complex point. But this, the idea of work, of pleasure in work, was not completely new at Ruskin's times. Uh, Morris himself tells us that the precedents were in uh, um, Robert o- Owen's uh, uh, utopian socialism in Britain at the beginning of the 19th century. And this, in the same years in France, Charles Fourier um, cooperative uh, societies. However, what was new in Ruskin was that the idea that the worker, um, the idea that the worker had to enjoy his work. 
and that joy could be fully attained only, mainly, through art, which could and should be available in different degrees, as, as we have seen, to the working classes as well. Ruskin, as we have heard, was one of the promoters, supporters, and teachers at the Working Men's College, um, a London institution established in 1854 by Christian socialist uh, um, and uh, led by um, F.D. Morris. He was also uh, the founder of uh, uh, the Museum of Sheffield, which had the aim to make art and beauty available to workers. Rather than emphasizing the stylistic motifs, iconography, or aesthetic response, the essay lays out the moral or imaginative elements which compose the inner spirit of the Gothic. Central to its argument was the emphasis of the artisan tradition of medieval art. art yeah. It's strongly bound its imagery to its making and purpose, to the material which was the aspect of art and the aim of art. Ruskin's claims were artistically and socially radical in that he gave precedence to the imagination and manual skill of the worker. And in doing so, he questioned the division between craft and fine art, first drawn in the Renaissance and then preserved in 19th century art academies. In The Stones of Venice, Ruskin shows the way an artwork emerges from the materials used and the human labor that measures, fits, and carves them. These issues would be taken up by primitive um, artists at the turn of the century. So Ruskin thought that uh, Gothic buildings uh, were also precious records. And he studied passionately the capital, for example, all the, the um, various uh, buildings of Venice, but in particular, the capitals of, uh, um, of the, the, the Gothic, uh, the um, Ducal Palace, uh, uh, which present various subjects. Uh, um, some of them have the vices and virtues, are divided into vice, vices and virtues, and Ruskin in particular points at this one. He thinks that this capital, the 18th capital, um, is uh, the most beautiful one. It, it, is, uh, it represents the moon and, uh, and the sun, and he thinks that it might be the representation of the time in which the building was built. Um, he, he said, I don't know, is it okay? Is the time? No. Okay, I, I can finish in a few minutes. Um, he, um, this, is, this is what he says about the capitals. Better, he said, the rudest work that tells a story or records a fact than the richest without meaning. By a sufficiently bold imaginative treatment and frank use of symbols, all such obstacles may be vanquished. Not perhaps in the degree necessary to produce sculpture in itself satisfactory, but at all events, so as to enable it to become a grand and expressive element of architectural composition. Take, for example, the management of the capitals of the Ducal Palace at Venice. History, as such, was indeed entrusted to the painters of its interior, but every capital of its arcades was filled with meaning the large one, the cornerstone of the whole, next the entrance, was devoted to the symbolism, uh, symbolization of abstract justice. And this is the capital on Solomon, the judgment of Solomon. So Ruskin's seeing the Gothic as savage, vital, and free was, of course, an idealization of the past. This is, was, was not exactly true. This, there are studies who um, have clearly pointed, pointed out and demonstrated this. He sought specific values in the past that could serve the present, but, it should be said, he did so by repeatedly acknowledging his position as a modern viewer 
of the, of the Gothic past. Distance in, style, in, distance in time was to be put to use. It is particularly interesting that Ruskin's distinct writing style includes himself as well as the viewer in the frame, as it were. He invites the reader viewer uh, to step into gondolas, to walk down narrow streets, to study and compare various fragments, method of fracture, and details of medieval buildings and sculptures. Rustic, Ruskin constantly reminds readers that they are looking at these distant works from a specific historical vantage point, and one for which the medieval world is remote and inscrutable. This is particularly remarkable in the latter works, in St. Mark's Rest and in the Bible of Amiens, works which are extremely interesting because they constitute a revision of, uh, of the Stones of Venice and the, the Seven Lamps of architecture, also, I mean, a radical de um, revision, in particular of the um, tone and the, the biases that he had at the time as a young man against Catholic uh, art, uh, Catholic faith, Catholic, uh, and, um, and he, these works are really, I mean, worth studying because show a much broader, broader um, um, outlook of, uh, um, of Ruskin at the time. But we have no time to deal with this and, and a, a full study should be dedicated to these revisions, rewritings. So another point, and I am approaching to the conclusion, that should be stated um, is that Ruskin rejected, rejected the imitation of Gothic motifs and facture. Artisans shouldn't pretend to be what they were not. Instead, he advocated that artisans and designers of his own day grasp the inner spirit i.e. motivation and logic of the Gothic um, from their distinctive vantage point in place and time. Moreover, Ruskin's own physical engagement with medieval art and architecture demonstrate that history must be put, as I was saying, in perspective. He believes that his own historical age is as authentic, can be as authentic as many of the past and should forge its own visual rather than mimicking others. So Ruskin is not a nostalgic. Sometimes this taste for this preference for Gothic has been defined, has been seen as a, a nostalgic, dreamlike, I mean, um, uh, attitude. But it was not, um, according to me, in my opinion. Um, so Ruskin's opposition to architectural restoration follows this same logic. Preservation was necessary, but restoration erased the marks of time and the traces of uh, other eras. So it was bad in this sense. To conclude, I would like to say just one word about the language of culture, which figures in my title. The whole of Ruskin's work, from the early essays on the poetry of architecture to for Clavigera, the, la the la latter work, um, which are letters to the workmen of England, uh, all his work as a whole is a vast inquiry into culture as a phenomenon, I would say. His judgments were personal and biased, one might object. He had strong likes and dislikes, as we say today. But his preferences stem from convictions that he had wrought through careful study and observations in order to draw a typology of culture. The modernists reproached him for writing about everything, on cookery and the Psalms, on Tintoretto and the Alps, on botany and birds, on Turner and Carpaccio. And this is true. And if we read Forskler Vigera, we can find some of these topics all in one letter sometimes. Uh, Dinah uh, Birch has spoken of uh, an ethical scaffolding, keeping all these works together, and I find that this is a marvelous image. So I wonder whether we can also uh, see that all this fits within a quest about what culture is like and how we can articulate it. In this sense, he was, in a way, a semiotician ante, ante literam. He was interested in seeing the ways in which an event, a painting, a building, 
what semioticians call a sign, becomes a piece of culture. To translate nonverbal signs, paintings, architecture, landscape, city views, into words is a process that it underwent continually, continuously in his work. For some scholars of, of culture of, um, of the 20th century, mid 20th century, culture is an eminently verbal act. Only once you put a nonverbal object into words, you make it culture. This idea may be objective today, but this was true, according to me, to Ruskin. At least his work is, is the enactment of this process of culture. The massive amount of sketches and wonderful drawings and watercolors he did were meant to be studies, ways to get a clearer view on topics, places, and then to write about them, to most of them. If Ruskin actually rescued some Venetian monuments from destruction, namely St. Mark's Cathedral, and you know, we know how important his work on ground has been for the history of conservation, his writings meant to preserve the memory of the buildings, to give them a lasting life, surviving the floods that then and nowadays, unfortunately, are still threatening to dissolve Venice. Thank you.